an incredible experience when he was five years old. The house in which he was living exploded when it was struck by lightning. The house was completely obliterated and this five-year-old boy was found in the middle of the wreckage, intact, temporarily blinded by what had happened, but otherwise perfectly safe, healthy, sound. People couldn't believe that he had survived what had just happened. Taron describes the experience to me and he tells me that he remembers this experience of intense light. He remembers being temporarily blinded. But what's happened in the decades since, from that moment on, his life changed. We function as electrical, electromagnetic bodies, magnetite crystals in our bodies, in our brains. Imagine what would happen to that system when you get struck by lightning. Well, this happened to Taron when he was five, and in the decades since, he has experienced frequent precognition or future viewing. He does not tell people about this because he doesn't want people to think he's crazy, but very often he will see something happening way ahead of it happening. He will know what's going to happen way ahead of it happening. He doesn't make a big thing of it. It's just something he has noticed in the decades since that event. A higher cognitive power released by that massive trauma to his brain and body. Now that's part of a wider syndrome called acquired savant syndrome, which I talk about in my book, Escaping from Eden. It is actually a phenomenon that is studied by serious neuroscientists. Peer reviewed science around the world has looked into acquired savant syndrome. And it is the pattern where higher cognitive powers are released by a brain event or a trauma, a central nervous system event. So Taron's story sort of fits within that, except there's another dimension to Taron's story. Periodically, since that lightning strike, he has an experience where he feels that he is pulled up out of his body, up into the sky, and while he's there, he receives a massive download of information and insight and then finds himself back in his body. One time he stayed up all night after this had happened, just making notes of all the information that he now seemed to be buzzing with. And it was complex mathematics, it was quantum theory, it was advanced physics, things he had never studied. And when he reviewed it the next day, it was all cogent, it was all coherent, and it had all come in an instant hit while he'd been up out of his body, up in the sky. That's how he experienced it. And Taron tells me that all through his life, he's had the most vivid impression that there are really two of him. There's the material him living on planet Earth, going through all the stuff of life. And then there's another him who is sort of the real him, somehow up in space or up in the sky, looking down at the material Taron, feeding him information, giving him nudges and guidance and assistance whenever that should be needed. That's how he has experienced life through a number of decades. Now, as you listen to that, you might think, I think something a bit like that has happened to me. You might have had moments or episodes where you think, I was getting assistance in that point. I suddenly had this insight. It was as if somebody whispered it to me. And I've often wondered where that help came from. And some people have the impression that it is another version of themselves feeding information. Well, that was how Taron has interpreted his life experience. But, you know, what we experience and how we interpret what we experience are two different things. And so many people might have an experience a bit like Taron's, but they'll say, I have a muse or I have a spiritual team, or I have a spiritual helper. We might have different language for it. 
and there may be different phenomena going on. But all the while, what we're doing is we're trying to interpret what we're experiencing. Taran's interpretation was there was this other self up in the sky in another dimension guiding this material self. Because there's a difference between the experience and the interpretation, others might come in with another explanation. And sure enough, when Taran mentioned this two selves experience to his doctor, his doctor listened politely and then politely asked if Taran would be interested in some medication. Because that was his framework for processing what Taran was experiencing. He didn't need medication because it wasn't a case of Taran being disturbed by the experience or that he couldn't cope with it or it was impinging on his ability to live life. Not at all. It was, in fact, an insight and an experience of assistance. So he politely said no thank you to the pill and enjoys this trans-dimensional journey to this very day. Now his doctor might have given Taran different advice if he had read a bit of history and in particular the story of an amazing people group called the Cathars. The Cathars appear in history in the 12th, 13th century, but how they began, where they came from in terms of their lifestyle and their belief system is a little bit unclear, other than that we know what the sources of their thought world were. Now, the Cathars lived in the south of France, in the Languedoc, and they were people who talked about life in exactly the same way that Taran did. They believed that human consciousness could be heightened, could be developed, that we could evolve as a species within the time frame of our own lives. We could make progress and that we could begin to experience other dimensions of ourselves and that we could get information from our cosmic self, feeding information to us, guiding us, assisting us. The cosmic self, who follows our material self around, they described as our light body. And through the journey and disciplines of ascension, our material bodies could evolve and change into a light body so that we become more who we truly are. We become more cosmic, cosmic beings. Now, this wasn't just a bunch of ideas that they would cherry picked from here and there. These ideas translated into a lifestyle and a community lifestyle that transformed society in the long dock to such an extent that it was their neighbours, their regional neighbours, who gave them the name Cathars. And the word Cathars means the good people or the pure ones. They were given that name because their neighbours could see the Cathars had built a better society, more loving, more peaceful, more generous, absent of the violence and crime that marked medieval Europe in the regions around them. They really had people's attention. So their neighbours called them the Cathars, the pure ones, the good people. Um, people from further afield refer, referred to them as Albigensians. And that word simply means the people, the Jean of Albi. Albi was a major metropolitan centre of the Languedoc. They were called Albigensians because this world of ideas and this lifestyle, that was simply how the people of Albi lived. That was what they believed. This is what the people of the Languedoc believed and how they lived. And so society had actually been altered by this pool of ideas. Where did they get the ideas from? Well, they got it from their reading of my old friend Plato and from various... Gnostic texts from the, the dawn of Christianity, 
Now, the Gnostic writers, or the writers we call Gnostic writers today, were writers who were very strongly influenced by Plato and whose worldview was essentially the same. So I'll say a little bit about what that worldview was. Plato had a very cosmic vision of things. He believed that in the beginning was consciousness, that the material universe is actually an emanation from a primordial field of consciousness, that the material universe came into existence so that consciousness could experience and express itself. And you and I are a part of that story. So within that story, you and I were aspects of that cosmic consciousness before we individuated as individual beings of consciousness. Then we incarnate as material beings and we have this material experience on planet Earth, here to learn something, and then we return enriched by what we've learned on the journey. That was Plato's picture of things. So he had this view of the, the cosmic self and the material self, and that whenever we learn or develop or discover, we're really recovering knowledge, understanding, information from our cosmic self, what the Cathars called our light body. So that's where they got those ideas from and from Gnostic texts, and it's possible from Hermetic texts as well, which swam in a similar worldview. Now, interestingly, Plato got some of his ideas from what we would call science, the application of logic to things we all observe. He also said he got some of his knowledge from ancestral information. In particular, information that had been passed on to an ancient Greek legislator called Solon. And Solon had got his information from the uh, remnant of the ancient Egyptian priesthood. And they said they had got some of their information from the previous civilization, specifically the Atlantean civilization. That's where the story of Atlantis comes from. Plato estimated that this chain of information was what would now be about 9,000 years old. And yet that chain of information carried enough power that it could transform a society in the south of France in the 1100s and 1200s. Usually when people see others who are different or who think differently to themselves, they scoff and they're suspicious. But what the Cathars had was so transparently good that all their neighbors called them the pure ones, the good people of Albi. Unfortunately, that is not the end of the story because what we experience and how we interpret what we experience, those are two different things. And how Pope Innocent III experienced the Cathar phenomenon was as a threat. And that was how he responded to it. From his perspective, things were going very wrong in the south of France. The south of France no longer looked like the medieval Europe under the religious hegemony of Rome that he wanted to see. And he wanted to bring the Cathars back into that matrix. The church was particularly nervous of what was happening in the Languedoc for other reasons. It wasn't just about the Cathars. Something had happened after Crusades, which were essentially about transferring ownership of some prime real estate on planet Earth from one group of powerful families to another group of powerful families. And a generation of young people had gone on these crusades thinking they were going on a holy war. And they came home traumatized by things they had experienced in war and traumatized by realizing their place in global society as the pawns of these other powers. And so when they came back, not only were many people struggling psychologically because of this, but a lot of them simply opted out 
of the medieval conventions of life in Europe at that time. They dropped out, to use the modern phrase, and what that meant was that nobility would renounce their inheritances. Merchants would walk out of their family businesses and renounce any right to that. These people found each other. They lived in community together. They rejected all use of money. They rejected every lever of fear that is usually applied against us. And one of the ways they like to demonstrate their rejection of fear was by physically embracing and caring for people who were not allowed to live in the towns. I mean, the lepers. This was a time before modern medicine, at a time when leprosy was considered the most contagious and dangerous disease on the planet's surface. These young people refused to be afraid. They were called mendicants because they lived a subsistence lifestyle and when that didn't meet their needs, they would literally beg for food. And mendicant means beggar. Now, naturally, this was a very disturbing experience for the middle and upper classes because they'd just lost a huge chunk of the generation that was supposed to carry their wealth and power forward. And it was happening on a massive scale, on a seismic scale. The church had never seen a fall away from its ranks like this before. And so the nobles were concerned, the middle classes were concerned, and the curia in Rome was very concerned. Well, the most famous leaders of that movement were <clears throat> uh, Giovanni Bernardone, the son of uh, a merchant. He was uh, part Italian, part French. He's known to the world by his nickname, Frenchy or Francisco. Uh, it's Francis of Assisi, of course, and Claire of the Poor Clares, who was a noblewoman who renounced her inheritance. They were among the significant leaders, but there were many, many more of the mendicant explosion. Well, the Pope, being disturbed by this, wanted to find a way to bring these people back into the fold, and he found a way. What happened is what, was that the mendicants were attacked by their neighbours, and when Francis found that uh, one of his prized uh, community centres had been burnt down, he went to Rome with some of his little brothers, as he called them, to petition the Pope to call off these Catholics who thought they were doing God a favour by burning Franciscan churches down. Well, the little brothers didn't want Francis to talk to the Pope because Francis was a very passionate, straight-talking, uh, naive kind of person. Let us do the talking, they said. And so they did. And so the Pope found a way of accommodating some of the leaders of that movement. And he decided they would all be labeled as, um, what was the word? Um, penitents. Penitents was a nice label to give them because it meant these were people with no power, no authority. It was almost like saying, well, these people are mentally ill, but they're recovering, or they're alcoholics, but they're recovering, and so we'll give them a bit of grace. And that was how they accommodated the mendicants. The Cathars, however, proved a harder nut to crack. First off, Pope Innocent III sent in some Cistercian monks to try and give them the correct teaching to bring them out of their heresy. And it didn't work. When these incredibly wealthy, powerful, pompous looking monastic leaders, and I say monastic, but these people would have looked like kings turning up in the long dark at the time. Well, they were received politely, but the locals quickly perceived these hierarchs as precisely what we don't want. And they made no headway at all. Well, feeling a bit crestfallen, some of these Cistercians met a couple of Spanish church leaders, Diego of Azevedo and Dominic Guzman. And the young Dominic Guzman, the deputy, quickly worked out why the Cistercian monks were not being taken seriously. And he said, look, if you want credibility with the Cathars, you have to live like they live. The Cathars have this amazing spiritual power to them. They've got an amazing integrity. They're having an incredible experience. If you're not in that, 
If you can't show you've got the same thing, if you can't live with the same simplicity and humility as their leaders, these were people who lived with great frugality and almost on a perpetual uh, fasting regime. You've got to do the same. If you don't do that, you're not going to be able to move freely or be taken seriously. So Diego and Dominic wrote to the Pope and they said, look, we think this is the way forward. We're happy to spearhead that. And what we offer to you is simply our pledge of complete obedience and fealty to you, uh, to Rome and to orthodoxy. Well, when Pope Innocent III received that, he thought, great, we're going to get the south of France back. So he sent them in. And although Dominic and his followers, the Dominicans, did exactly what they promised uh, with great zeal and love and won the respect of the locals, the locals, in the end, didn't need what the Dominicans had to offer. They were already happy. Thank you very much. And so Pope Innocent III now found that his patience was wearing thin. And so now he raised up an army and he sent the army to deal with the Cathars. If we can't convert them, then we'll just have to kill them. And that was his calculation. The slaughter that followed in the south of France is by any calculation the world's first genocide. To give you a sense of scale of what happened, the Nazi war machine killed 0.06% of the world's population. The Roman Catholic Church's crusade against the Cathars killed 0.26% of the world's population. The first major push uh, was referred to as Le Grand Mazel, the Great Slaughter, in which 10,000 Catholic militia killed 20,000 people in a single day, men, women and children, the entire population of the town of Brésier. The Pope was responding to people with different ideas as if they posed a military threat. Talk about what we experience and what we interpret as two different things. Why would you respond to ideas that had produced a better world as if it were a military threat? Well, the way he raised that army gives us the answer to that question. He offered to the militia all the lands of the Cathars. The leaders of the army could reportion that land to any man who would serve for 40 days in that army. That's all he needed to do. He would get land and then he would get a plenary indulgence, which means a free ticket to heaven in exchange for fighting for 40 days. And here's the punchline, a pledge of fealty to the Pope and the King of France. So that pledge tells you straight away what this war was about from the Pope's perspective. It was all about safeguarding power and control for royal and religious elites. And if people had ascended to the point where they'd built a better society and didn't need the powers anymore, well, that had to be dealt with. That's why it was perceived as a military threat. But it's a real indication of the power of the Cathars ascension practices and the Cathars beliefs built on Plato, built on early Gnostic Christianity and this experience of higher dimensions of information being fed by their light body to their material body. You listen to what the Cathars believed, it sounds very vague, but it produced something very concrete. The neighbouring regions were seeing what the Cathars had worked. The phenomena that the Cathars talked about, this higher information, this contact with the light body, this transformation of self, it rang bells with me when I first read it because it was very much like something I'd seen in somebody else. Seraphim of Sarov, 
a Russian Orthodox mystic hermit who lived from 1759 to 1833. When I read his story, it blew my socks off because I recognised the phenomena that accompanied his ministry, phenomena of precognition, remote viewing, future viewing, insight, healing. And these were eyewitness, these were catalogued, these were things that really did happen around this person in a time and place when this was definitely not normal. That was not what Russian Orthodoxy looked like for the most part at that time. But Seraphim was so consistent in operating this way that thousands of people would flock to Sarov hoping to get some counsel from him or at the very least to see this great Staretz, this great spiritual leader in action. The idea of the light body was something very real to Seraphim. His name, Seraphim, means the shining one, and it was a prophetic name that his superior gave to him. Prophetic because there were six documented occasions when eyewitnesses saw his body physically emitting light while he was in an altered state of consciousness. People who didn't see that always remarked on his peaceful spirit. And stories were told of his life as a hermit in the forest where animals would be completely undisturbed in his presence. There was a bear that would come and sit with him and he would feed the bear. People told that story as a way of commemorating that there was something very different about his aura, his vibe, his state of mind. He was an incredibly peaceful person. And then all these phenomena of precognition and remote viewing, future viewing, telepathic connection, healing, Needless to say, he was remembered for those amazing things. Now, when he would have someone come and visit him, he would often be able to, without them saying anything, tell them all sorts of things about their lives. One time somebody came to him and he was able to tell them exactly how much money he had spent on trying to fix the condition that he wanted Seraphim to heal. And then Seraphim was able to heal it. Another example, he was standing one day, there were about 5,000 people standing in front of him and he called out to a man in the crowd and he said, you, sir, you're very anxious because your horse has been stolen and your horse is your livelihood. It's in the next town, tethered in front of the bakery. The person who took it has left it there. Go there, find it, just take it away. Called out to a woman, you're very anxious because your son is missing in action. He's just returned to your house. If you go home, you'll find him. So it was real accurate information that he was getting. How did he get it? Well, when he was asked, he said, well, I just get myself into my peaceful place. And then I speak the first thing that comes into my mind and I find it to be correct. So that was his modality. So where was that information coming from? Was it from his light body? Was it from other entities whispering to him? Plato believed some of his information came from contact with non-human entities, interdimensional entities. Was Seraphim now having that same experience? Well, what we experience and how we interpret what we experience are two different things. And how Seraphim interpreted the experience was through his very orthodox Christian religious grid. He believed he was getting messages from angels, Our Lady, or the Holy Spirit. And it was the Holy Spirit who really he felt he was in contact with on a regular basis, though he had experiences of the others as well. Well, I could relate to that because of things I had experienced. I'll tell you about something that happened for me right at the very beginning of my church-based ministry in the 1980s, when I was very young indeed. I was working at a church in London, just south of King's Cross. And I remember one occasion when somebody came for prayer for healing, which was a regular part of our pattern of life in that church. I'll call her B. Now, by the time B got to our church for prayer, she had walked past a number of specialist hospitals. So we were in a part of London that was the place of last resort for many people suffering complex issues. 
B was one of those, and she was desperate. She walked with great difficulty with a pair of crutches, and she hobbled her way down the street into our church and sat down with myself and, I'll call him Pastor Irwin, and we began, as we always did, by asking what B would like prayer for. And so she talked about her back problems, that she was in constant pain, the mobility issues that she had. And then, seemingly from out of the blue, my boss, Pastor Irwin, said, tell me about your dad. Well, B told us about her father, and immediately her posture changed. She seemed even more scrunched up than she looked before and told us a very unhappy story about her upbringing. It wasn't a story of abuse as such, but sadly her father had such issues that it was easy to see why B had emerged from that upbringing full of hurt and resentment. So Pastor Irwin then said, B, do you think you're ready to let go of all the resentment that you've rightly felt towards your dad because it's not helping you, it's hurting you. Do you want to release that? And she said, yes, yes I do. So we prayed a very short prayer and he said, now I just want you to verbalize your intention to let all that go. You're not gonna invest any more energy into that anger, abandon all hope of a better past and just say, that happened, it was bad, I'm leaving it behind, I'm now going to live my life, and I don't wish ill on my father, whatever our relationship is or is not, I don't wish ill on him, I'm just going to let all that go. And she did, she found a way of verbalising that with whatever level of sincerity she felt able to muster. I could immediately see her posture loosening up, and she was breathing more deeply, and then after a pause, she bent down to pick up her crutches to go. And I said, oh, B, we haven't prayed for you yet. We haven't prayed for your back. And suddenly she said, oh, my God, I'm completely healed. And all the pain had gone. She walked carrying her crutches as she walked home. It was an amazing, um, what can you call it, miracle, spontaneous healing. So afterwards, I said to Erwin, that was amazing. What made you think to ask that question about B's dad? He said, well, you know, I just looked at her and I thought, well, there is a lady who is clearly out of balance in some way. So I just threw up the question, what do we need to do to help rebalance this lady? And the thought came into my mind from somewhere, ask her about her dad. Now, again, what we experience and how we interpret what we experience are two different things. So I interpreted that through my Christian worldview, or well, that must be the Holy Spirit giving us what we call a word of knowledge. Because my paradigm at the time was that Christians were the conduit of God's grace to the world. And so God helps people in ministry to help others by giving them bits of information like that, what we called a word of knowledge. And that's what I believed it was for a long, long time. There's nothing wrong with that explanation at all. However, if I were to sit down with a Nanga or a Sangoma, a traditional healer from Southern Africa, they would hear me describe that interaction with B and they'd say, ah, the ancestors. The ancestors clearly told you. The spirits of the ancestors gave you that information. If I were to sit down with my Navajo friend, I'll call him Troy, because in Echoes of Eden, I do change people's names for their protection, and he's Troy in the book. He'd say, ah, oh, yes, it's the spirits. And they may be spirits of ancestors, they may be other dimensional spirits, they may be something else. 
doesn't really matter. They just provided you information, which you tested when you offered it to the lady, turned out to be correct, turned out to be the key. Now, what's interesting about that framing that you would get from the Sangomas and Nangas of Southern Africa or from a traditional healer from the Navajo tradition is that they see healing as a contact modality. And what they do, whether they light a fire or they drop objects on the floor and read the objects or they invoke an altered state of consciousness, whatever modality they use, what they are looking for is insight to be given by the ancestral spirits of the person who's ill. And then the ancestral spirits will communicate with your spirits and you'll be able to pick it up through the medium of these objects, fires, smokes that you might use. But the modality is it's a contact phenomenon. Now, I find that really interesting. Some people listening to me would say, Paul, I thought you were a Christian. How can you reframe the story of a word of knowledge as a contact phenomenon with ancestral spirits, interdimensional entities? Well, the answer is that that framing was actually there in the roots of Christianity. In very early Christianity, the worldview of the Sangomas and Nangas and guardians of Navajo tradition, it was all there. If you go to the book of Hebrews, the writer there says that each one of us is surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And by that he means ancestral spirits, you can find it in Hebrews 12, who are very interested in us and our well-being and how we are running the race marked out for us. And they are there to support us, is the picture. If you go to 1 John 4, also in the New Testament, the writer there fully expects the early Christians to be receiving information from entities he calls spirits. Now, he never identifies what they are or where they're from. What's more important to him is that you filter what you hear. Always weigh it up. Keep your autonomy. Keep your sovereignty. Don't believe anything and everything somebody tells you, even if they're a spirit. Weigh it up for yourself. So what were the spirits he was talking about? Were they ancestral spirits? Were they our light bodies, our higher selves? Were they interdimensional beings such as Plato describes? Were they material beings like you and me, but who communicate telepathically? If you look at how the word spirits is used in other languages and other cultures around the world, they don't always refer to non-material things. Sometimes they refer to physical beings. But if the being is more advanced, or has more advanced travel technology, they might be called a spirit. Uh, the moon spirit in New Guinea uh, was a being that looked like a gecko. Not an ethereal thing, a physical thing. And so once again, we've got this plural team around us to help us. It's an invisible team but at times maybe a material team, and it's there right in the roots of Christianity. It's there in the roots of Judaism as well. Now, here's where we begin to cross over with paleo contact, because in my books, Escaping from Eden and the Scars of Eden, I argue that the stories of the Elohim in the Bible are in fact a summary form of the stories of the sky people in the Mesopotamian source narratives, and that those entities are what you and I would call extraterrestrials. Those stories in the Bible recall a time when our ancestors were governed over by non-human entities called Elohim. There then comes a time in the biblical history when the Elohim are no longer physically present on the planet's surface, but they've left behind their monarchies and their priesthoods. And all of a sudden, the priesthood's job is to achieve remote communication with powerful beings who are no longer present. 
So you reread the stories of the priests and the high priests and the prophets, and you'll realize that from King Saul on, that's what you're looking at, remote communication. How are they going to achieve it? There are hints that there's some technology involved, the Ark of the Covenant, the Urim and Thummim. But the regular workaday method was for the priests to go into the tent of meeting. When they went into the tent of meeting, they had to be robed and their robes had to be soaked in cannabosom oil. And if cannabosom sounds like something else, well, that's because it is something else absolutely drenching their clothes. And then the tent walls were drenched with cannabosom oil as well. Four layers of fabric as thick as a man's hand. So these priests are inhaling a lot of fumes at this point. And then the cannabosom would be burned as a smoke as well. So they are really inhaling it. They are operating in a thick chemical soup in order to achieve remote communication suddenly it looks a whole lot more like the practices of Nangas and Sangomas and traditional healers in shamanic traditions, where oils, resins, smokes are used to induce an altered state of consciousness so that interdimensional communication can now happen. They are altering how their brains are operating so that they can get this contact going. That is what lies at the roots of priestly practice in the Jewish tradition. So all of a sudden, we've got a contact modality and the priests would do their consultations when information was needed or when healing was needed for royal powers who now employed the priesthood. So it's all sounding a little bit more similar. is the Mayan story of paleo contact. You can look it up in Escaping from Eden and the Scars of Eden. It talks about an ET intervention in our development as a species, and it speaks of a time when our ancestors had higher cognitive powers than we do. They could do things like remote view, future view, they had better telepathic connection, better self-healing. According to that story, no altered state is needed to reactivate that. The punchline of that story and of other stories around the world is that absent of toxins in the environment, higher cognitive powers are the norm for human beings. So if we can recover our knowledge of how to live healthily and in balance and in harmony on our planet, we will begin to operate with these higher cognitive powers. And I can say I've experienced glimpses of that process for myself. Now, when the Popol Vuh talks about higher cognitive powers in the past being downgraded, it uses the language of the human's sight being limited. How is our sight limited? It's limited by distance. We can't see beyond the horizon. We can't see in detail in the distance. We can't look into space. Our sight is limited by time. We can only see what's present. We can't see the future. We can't see the past. Our sight is limited by surfaces. We can't see into things. We can't see behind things. Of course, we've invented technology to do these things that we feel we ought to be able to do. Our sight is limited to this dimension, this frequency that we're living in. We can't see other dimensions. And so when the Popol Vuh says our sight used to be better, imagine taking those limitations off. When you take those limitations off, that's when you have higher cognitive power, future viewing, remote viewing, precognition, telepathic connection. Being able to see beyond surfaces gives you powers of healing 
And what the Popol Vuh suggests, and I would say it's there in the epic narrative from Nigeria of the Basi and the Thai, and in other narratives besides, is that absent of toxins in the environment, these are our natural powers. If we can recover our health and our balance as individuals on planet Earth, then we start moving with greater consciousness and higher cognitive powers. We have help in becoming more conscious. We have help to support human life on the planet, help for our ascension. The earliest stories of paleo contact are stories of helpers arriving on planet Earth to teach the humans how to live in balance with the planet. Which plants are good for food? Which are good for medicines? Which are good for higher consciousness? Which are the toxins and how to avoid them? How to cleanse your local environment? All this was part of the original tutelage our ancestors were given in the beginning. And the memory of that is carried by cultures all around the world, carried by indigenous cultures, carried in our folklore. Those stories never make their way into our school textbooks or into the meta-narrative that you will find repeated by mainstream media or by the powers. But folklore, indigenous tradition, maintains the knowledge that we have help and that there are ways of engaging that help. And I don't see this in any way a contradiction of a faith in God. It's just a matter of instrumentality, that very often this is how the help comes. At the end of the day, every one of us is a team effort. Let's say yes to that team, because I will take whatever help is available to us.